In this conference so far, we, you know, we posed the question, we had some interesting examples of new uh, products, technologies. Um, we tried to add, make sure we were considering things in context. Uh, this morning, we had very much of a broadening perspective. Um, Obviously, we didn't cover everything, but I think actually quite a lot was was presented. Not all, not all un, uncontroversial, but and now we are moving into um, a step beyond where we were yesterday. Um, yeah, we heard about some very interesting research, but that is research which uh, links back into is dependent on some really fundamental science uh, that is happening, you know, and obviously we can't present all of it, but I think we've, uh, we, we aimed here to come up with a couple of examples that will give a sense uh, of, um, of that. So this uh, future perspectives panel, seeing and responding to early signals. I'm a great believer in being able to recognize weak early signals, because that's where it's coming from. But the, the skill in doing that is critical. And we have a couple of very excellent uh, speakers uh, for that. So we'll begin with uh, Professor Micha Spira from Hebrew University in Yisrael, who's going to speak about uh, neuron on a chip. What a fascinating talk. Okay. So Micha. Thank you. So I have to, to uh, deal with three problems. The first, no, I have to do it here. That's yeah. the first problem that I have, is that I have to do it from here because of some technical difficulties. So please, I think that it will be better if you move a little bit in that direction. <laughs> the second uh, problem is, of course, uh, the problem of your blood flow. Since you just had lunch, uh, most of your blood is in the abdomen and not in your head, and I hope to be able to keep you awake. The third problem that I have to deal with is that I realized while sitting here and listening to you this morning that uh, I'm in the wrong place because you guys are talking about business and I'm not interested in business whatsoever. I, <laughs> no, no. I am interested in business. I am amazed at the fact that when I went to, to develop my career, I was really fascinated by science and I could not understand why people are fascinated by money. But with time, I started to realize that application is very important. I'm very fascinated by application, so your talks uh, this morning uh, were very interesting for me. So now to my business. Uh, the dream of assembling cybernetic organisms or cyborgs is with us for approximately 50 years, and it is now becoming very clear that this is going to be reality. Once the field mature, it will offer medicine great uh, advantages, including replacement of uh, injured organs, such as the eye, the nose, the ear, lost limbs. But it could also uh, add functions or improve functions of existing organs, like thinking, memory, linking neurons with computers or neurocomputers, etc. The problem, in my mind, in developing cyborgs or cybernetic organisms or hybrids, cell, neuron, cell electronic hybrids, and I will all of the time refer to neurons, but neurons are just <laughs> one type of cell. So neuroelectronic hybrids, the problem is in linking two worlds that developed differently, a different, on different time scales, from different materials, and by different entities, cells or living organism by evolution or God, if you wish, and silicon by mankind. And the problem is to link those two worlds together. And this is the academic or the uh, scientific or technological challenge. So neuroelectronic hybrids are basically composed of three components. The neurons that are drawn here, the electronic device, silicon-based device, probably because no one is going to replace silicon industry after all the investment in the silicon industry, and the interfacing molecular uh, layer in between. This molecular layer 
has a tremendous role in building such hybrids because it has to disguise the silicon aspect of the hybrid so that the neuron or a cell will think that this is not a chip but this is a friend neuron or a friend cell. So developing the right molecular structure to link between the two is a very important aspect. Also, as I will show you, you'll be amazed to realize that while I'm talking, the neurons in your brains are moving. They are not stationary. They are not holding the same position. Not that a neuron is swimming in your skull, but a neuron is forming new connections and extending new neurites or new extensions so that it can learn and remember. The fact that we can learn and remember lies in the basic uh, uh, principle of living cells, and this is that the cells can change, so that the history changes the structure of the neuron and changes the connections that the neuron is making with other neurons, so that it can somehow store the new information that is coming in. So while I'm talking, your neurons are moving. I will show it to you. But if you think about a neuroelectronic chip, then you have to think that the neuron will just move along the, the chip and you want it to be placed in a position so that it can communicate with the chip in the right location. And this is a challenge too. So it's not enough to develop the chemistry to link the cell with the surface, the silicon oxide surface of a chip, but you have also to somehow <laughs> give the neuron anchor places so that it can stay and make sense. I mean, for a hybrid to operate, a neuron within a network should uh, be uh, in re maintain the relation with the chip. The project that we are dealing with uh, has two aspects. Neuron transfer information along axons, along these long lines, by uh, electrical signals that propagate along this structure. And in between neurons, the information in tr is transported or transferred by neurotransmitters that are released from this neuron and are uh, uh, recorded or recorded by the postsynaptic neuron. So this is the chemical information. Chemical, this is called a synapse, a chemical synapse. This is the site where most drugs are operating. This is also the site where chemical warfare reagents are uh, uh, damaging our uh, function and nerve gases are in fact blocking the transmission or somehow the, the transmission between uh, this uh, presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. So the chip that or the hybrid that we are trying to develop has two aspects. One is to record the electrical activity, and the other one is to record the chemical activity. I would mainly focus on the electrical activity, but I want to just explain in one word that what we did was to functionalize the gate of a transistor with receptors to this neurotransmitter, and in fact, and, and trying to create an artificial synapse so that the neuron that releases neurotransmitter can activate a transistor. Just think about it if you want to replace a limb. All the nerves that are coming to the muscle are releasing neurotransmitter. So the best way to record the information is to collect the transmitter and to translate it to electrical activity. But we ended by, I mean, we have been able to do that, and we ended by developing a new sensor for nerve gases, which is now almost ready for application. So let me start by, sh by showing or proving to you that the neurons, that neurons are really motile structure, very dynamic motile structure. I've selected to show, to demonstrate it to you by using an extreme example. I want to show you that that is interesting for you because you're dealing with uh, medical problems. So this is injuring a nerve. When you injure a nerve, an axon, the axon regenerate. Even in our central nerve system and the spinal cord, the neurons can regenerate. It's only the environment that prevents them from the regeneration. But this is how it looks. And if you look at this time scale, you'll see that the nerve is, after injury, is starting to grow a new part here. Can you turn off, dim the light off a little bit here? Oh, 
in top, but then they will talk. Okay, so you can see that the cut axon is developing a new uh, a part here. It is called the growth cone. And this new part will then extend and further extend, and it will grow and grow and interact with other neurons. So a nerve cells can grow. It can, after injury, recruit uh, the necessary component to regrow. How does it do it? So it's like constructing a building. The nerve can assemble a cytoskeleton. In red, you can see the, the uh, tracks here that are, in fact, uh, polymerizing, and they serve as the cytoskeleton uh, that holds or that supports the new structure as it is being built. But the skeleton in a nerve, not like a, a skeleton of a house or a big building, is also serves as tracks along which the nerve is transporting material to the building site, to the construction site. And you can see, uh, by the way, that this cytoskeleton by itself is dynamic. It's not just a skeleton that sits there because you've placed it there, but it also recover itself and build itself continuously. And it sends along it, with molecular motor, packages of material that support the growth. Even if you don't injure a nerve and you just look at neuron grown on a silicon oxide matrix, they move. This is how they move. They are looking, this, this is, these are not many neurons, this is a part of a neuron with contact sites, these uh, little things here are looking for a place to make a synapse. So they move all the time. So the point that I was trying to show you, this first point, is that a neuron, a cell, is a dynamic entity, and a network in our brain is not like a network in a computer because the hardware can repair itself, it can change, it can form new connections. The hardware is a software, basically. Okay. So with this information in mind, we started the journey of uh, trying to record uh, activity, electrical activity from neurons on a chip by designing a transistor. This transistor has special properties. The transistor is embedded in silicon oxide so that it is protected from the water. And as you know, silicon transistors, this, this entire world is not made to take bath it is made to be in dry environment, but our cells, our brain, are living in water. So a big problem in such products, and I'm trying to think in the terms that you're using, has to be water resistance uh, transistor. The transistor has other properties. Uh, it has a floating gate. The floating gate is exposed to the uh, water solution or ionic solution. It's also a depletion type and not enhancement type transistor, but this is only for the professionals that, that are uh, aware of those terms. This transistor was constructed or fabricated for us first by Tower Semiconductor here in Israel, and then with our partners in Belgium, in, in IMEC, uh, we improved it a little bit, and our first nerve culture on this transistor is shown here. These are very large neurons with an axon. This is the cell body, and you can see that the cell body sits here on, the, on several uh, transistors or the gates, the floating gates of several transistors. And if we took advantage, of course, of the neurons that we selected, and now I have to tell you a little bit about this neuron. This neuron is a neuron from a, a C organ, organism. It's called Aplysia. Aplysia got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Not Aplysia, but Eric Kandel, who worked on Aplysia, of course, for uh, his studies on the molecular basis of learning and memory. This is the best model for uh, analysis of learning and memory. The, the neurons are huge. We can stick two microelectrodes into those neurons. Here is one, and here is the other one can, for stimulation, the other for recording. And then when we fire an action potential, this is the impulse, the electrical impulse that is generated by this neuron. We can record the field potential by the transistor. The field potential, as you can see, whereas the action potential, this is the intracellular recording, the voltage drop across the membrane of a neuron. 
is in the range of 70, 80 to 100 millivolt with a duration of few milliseconds. The field potential, which is generated by the current that flows outside the neuron, is much smaller, but is still discernible, is much larger than, than the noise that is peaked here. But we were very unhappy with these signals, because if you want to go and start using those chips in vivo, that is implanted into bodies, then you have to have a much larger signal so that you are not going to record noise and start dealing with noise rather than with very robust signals that cannot be uh, uh, taken or, or that you will not make mistakes in interpretations. So we started to begin to think what could, how could we improve this uh, signal? Theoretical consideration and experiments by other labs suggest that there is a resistor in the extracellular space between the neuron and the chip. And the current that goes across this circuit uh, uh, is generated by the action potential, and the voltage drop across this seal resistance is the uh, signal that we record with the transistor. So if we can increase the resistance here, then maybe we can get better recordings. Now, the resistance here is, is formed by the very narrow cleft that we can, that the cell or the neuron is producing in relation to the silicon oxide substrate. And many people think that this is the limitation and you cannot get better seal resistance because there are molecules that are sticking from the plasma membrane into this gap and there are charge that cannot, that will not allow you to squeeze or to make a very a narrow, narrower gap in this uh, region. We thought that uh, this should be challenged, and what we did, what Ariel Cohen did, is one of the students who is now uh, uh, working in a research group at Intel, uh, he took those neurons and simply applied a very, very, very minute pressure on the neuron just to see whether we can improve the coupling. And this is what he saw. If you apply pressure on this neuron, you can see that the signal is increasing. If you further apply pressure, you see that the signal is changing to a mode that uh, uh, indicates that it is really an intracellular recording. So the pressure is apparently activating small channels that are facing now the gate of the transistor so that there is direct communication or ohmic communication between the intracellular uh, uh, cytosol of the cell and the, and the gap. With this idea, or with this finding, we started to try and innovate and think, is there a way to really increase the coupling between a neuron and a transistor? And is there a way to anchor the neuron so that it will stay in place in respect to the transistor? We decided to try and harness a very basic phenomenon in, in, in biology. And that is a phenomenon that was developed many, many years ago in evolution. And that was the problem that, that organisms, unicellular organism, has to feed too. It's not only us that needs some energy resources, external energy resources. And they feed on bacteria, but they don't have a mouth. They are single cell. And the way that they do it is by what we call professionally phagocytosis. That is internalization of, let's say, bacteria or a particle into their uh, interior. The way that it is done is that the on the membrane of those unicellular organisms, there are some receptors that can recognize the particle, and the interaction, the chemical interaction, sorry, the chemical interaction between the, between the cell and this bacteria somehow activate, and I'm not going to elaborate how, activate processes that cause phagocytosis or engulfment of this particle. Then when the particles is engulfed in the membrane, within the membrane of the uh, organism, of the unicellular organism, then there is uh, some mechanism by which this neck is nicked, and you see that the organism is now in a, 
in a vacuole within the cell. We thought that if we can grow on the chip surface micronails or mushroom-like structures and can functionalize those micronails with a molecule that will make this neuron think that this is something that he would like to internalize, then the neuron will swallow this bait and we will have a micronail stuck into the cell and this will give us two things. On the one hand, it will anchor the cell better in respect to the transistor and on the other hand, it will increase the resistance simply by, first by increasing the, the contact area, the surface area of contact <laughs> And maybe it will narrow down the gap between the membrane and this. And this. Uh, we developed the chemistry. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on that. And it went in two ways to be organized like industry. The biologist and the chemist started to try to select for the right molecule that will induce phagocytosis by the neurons. This was one aspect. And the other one was the physicist went and started to try and build a micronate, a micro mushroom, and see whether we can do it. And what we did was, this is what uh, uh, Yossi Shapir uh, from our university did. He has been able to fabricate micronates or mushroom-like structures that look like that, about one and a half micron high, the stock is about half a micrometer and the mushroom head is about one micrometer. We have been able to functionalize it with a substrate that we develop and move to see whether this is biocompatible, whether the cells, the neurons will grow on this substrate. And this is how a neuron looks with SEM, scanning electron microscopy, on a matrix of micronates. It loves it. These are just pictures that shows you how the uh, matrix looks, the micronail matrix looks. And you can see here one, an axon, and the axons and neurites are covering the micronails and maybe even engulfing them. And some of them looks like that, as if they really like to <coughs> engulf the micronails. But this is not really uh, convincing because you cannot see what is happening below the membrane of a cell. So we had to prepare thin sections through those micronails and we could not believe it but this is how it looks. So here is a cross section now through a micronail and through the cell. And you can see the micronail and you can see the membrane of the cell and the cell loves it. But these are cultured aplysia neurons. So we have been able to develop or to build micronails on a substrate. The cells engulf them, phagocytose them, and it really looks like the skin that we drew before we knew. But my colleague, biologist, told me, well, maybe this is peculiar for the aplysia preparation that you're using. So we immediately tried many cell type, including uh, neurons from vertebrates and so on. And this is how it looks. Here you see some micronails and a cell. This is PC12. It's for cell biologists, this is a, like the, a very important tool for experiments. And if you look closer, you can see the micronails engulfed by the PC12 cells. And you can see that the membrane of the uh, PC12 cells is really coming into close opposition to the micronail. This, this, this was very good, uh, very good news. This is a neuron that engulfs micronet. This was very good news, but then people start asking you, okay, but electron microscopy is very nice, but you fix the material. You apply fixatives. So maybe we are looking at artifacts. Maybe this is not true. So there is a way now using confocal microscopy I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a microscope that gives you a, a, the, uh, a, the power to look at very thin sections. And you can see that when we grew a neuron 
on a matrix of micronails, you can see the many micronails like negative staining. The, the neuron is uh, uh, stained with uh, fluorescent dye. And if you look closer, you can see the micronails. And you can, if you make thin sections and computer reconstruction, you can see that the micronail here is the stock. And here is the mushroom head. The micronail is engulfed by the cell. So the cells really engulf the micronail. But remember that I told you that, in fact, neurons and other cells, or neurons and neurons, have to recognize each other. And they respond to the chemistry, to the surface chemistry, such that they know that they are sitting in front of another friend neuron or they know that they have to make a synapse, they have to differentiate. And one of our thinking was that if we are successful in producing a micronail and functionalizing with the proper chemistry, with the proper molecular coating, then the cell will recruit a cytoskeleton which will help it to really hold on onto the micronail. And our Electron microscope, electron micrograph suggested that this is happening, but with those electron micrographs, I could not convince anyone. The way to look at it was to try and light up the cytoskeleton with molecular tools that I'm not going to elaborate on. It's called GFP, and we uh, uh, label a certain molecule that is uh, used to generate force in the cells, acting, and this is what we saw. We saw that each micronail is being hugged by assembly of, micro, of actin filaments around the micronail. So what we can say is that we have developed now a way, a gate, a transistor gate, a tr three-dimensional transistor gate that has micronail sticking out with the right shape, and the shape is probably very important, with the right chemistry, molecular coating of the micronail that can fool the neurons to think that this is a real partner and the neuron really hug these micronails and form a very tight junction. This is the, these are the micronails uh, hugging the nail with actin, and this is another uh, molecular uh, entity that uh, covers the nail, just to show you that this does not happen uh, with anything. Now, going to the electrical signals. We compared the, the, the amplitude of the electrical signals that we can record with flat electrodes, just simple flat passive electrodes, in respect to micronail functionalized electrode, and the signal on the flat electrode is that little thing here on the same scale as this with the micronet. So we have been able to improve the coupling, the electrical coupling between the neuron and a tr a, 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 an electrode, a passive electrode uh, that has micronet on it. We are now building transistors or fabricating transistor with micronails on them. Here's a micronail on a, on a floating gate. And uh, you can see that we can do it now. And uh, probably we'll be able to come with a, a system in which the recording of uh, neuronal activity uh, from uh, cultured recording of activity of neuron in culture on transistor that will be much, much better than is pre presently available uh, on the market. And uh, these are my colleagues, Professor Yossi Shapir, Shlomo Itzhayek, and the students that were involved in the project. Thank you. Can you, can you influence the direction of the growing of the neuron by these nails? Yes. Uh, in 
affect uh, the neurons. Yeah, we can influence the directionality of growth of the neurons by conventional ways, and uh, micronades uh, also the very early growth cones, neurites that extend, are going in between the micronades, and then when they start extend, they cover the micronades, but they tend to go in lines in between the micronades. And we have now chemistry that will uh, tell them to go on top of the micronaves immediately. So. Okay. This was really a long time ago. Could you say a word on the application, please? Because we are in a business environment. Yeah. So, the applications. I think that uh, uh, the first, I'm going to tell you that the first thing that we are going to, we're going in steps. First of all, I told you, but I didn't elaborate on it, that we have developed a sensor for chemical, uh, for nerve gases, uh, simply because we were trying to produce this uh, artificial synapse. Uh, this sensor is uh, the best that I know about, and uh, it can be used uh, quite rapidly in a much better way than, than uh, the strategy that is being used now. I'm going to elaborate on that. Do I have time? Okay. So, if you know, this is not the Israeli uh, army methodology, but it's all over the world. First of all, we are all waiting for a, a attack, a terrorist attack, uh, using nerve reagents. Secondly, if it will happen, no one will know how to deal with this, although there are forces that are specifically trained for that. The way that it is being done is that you send people to the site and they start using all kinds of pumps and so on to, uh, to, to identify that there is uh, a, a, a gas. It's not gas, okay, it's aerosol, I'm going to say gas. Just because this is how it is being used. Then, each, uh, every one hour or so, the commander is going to send a group of people that have to be dressed properly and, and, and so on, to check again if it's still there and it's still there, and he's going to make prediction on how it is going, how it's going to, to deal with the situation. This is so ridiculous. We have now those transistors that can be placed or dropped from the air, spread over or placed like stations uh, in streets and urban places are the site where, where a terrorist attack is being uh, expected. And they can broadcast so you can generate a map, distribution map of the contamination within online in real time. It will continuously inform on what is going on, and this is how you can manage the situation. Now, we are ready to, to start with a small investment. I, I'm not, I haven't calculated it, because I'm not trained. I think that I have this uh, desire uh, to go into business, but I'm not trained, so I'm not going to make mistakes. Someone calculated that it's not a big investment to go from a prototype to to real uh, experiment. Now, when people are talking about it, they say, okay, what is the medical use? You can, you have another aspect to this detector. And this is a big ethical problem. When a doctor will have to decide who among the injured person is going to be treated, he will have to make decision, uh, subjective decisions based on blood pressure, etc., etc. But one can take blood sample and measure it with such a device, and the device can make decisions fast, efficiently, etc. This is one. Regarding the electrical recording, there is a small market, research market, for electrical recording. We are in a position, I think, I'm not going to elaborate on how, to be able to generate uh, recordings, intracellular recordings from neurons, intracellular. No one can do that. We can put those nerves now inside the cells, not outside the cell. We can functionalize them with sensors, let's say, for uh, 
phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and things like that. So it can be a lab on a chip, diagnostic chip. But I think that eventually, and I am willing to bet on that, maybe none of us will be here to claim it, they're winning. But uh, we're going to see cyber. It's, it's for real. I don't think that it's not. I mean, and, and, and if you guys that are eager to make money think all the time of how to do it fast, to save money, to go worldwide, not to spend, to invent small gadgets, not very elaborate, come on. Your money on that. The linkage between damaged neurons can be achieved with those devices. If you can record on one hand neuronal activity and you can record from single neuron, you can amplify it. This is easy. You can transmit it to another location and stimulate. I did not tell you about stimulation because we are not very good at it. It is very difficult to stimulate. You have to have transistors, switch transistors and so on that are not operating so well and the amount of current that you can inject is, is, is a problem. Uh, when the uh, transistor is external to the cell, to the cell or the neuron, we're going to insert the transistor partially into the neuron. If if you can see the nails uh, that, that I've shown, this will make it possible to stimulate the neuron e easier in an easier way. If you talked about simulation in relation to recent publications in the literature. Have you considered the applicability of the micro nails to osseo integration? I asked because I had osseo integration, integration with bone of tooth implants, for instance. I asked because I have a dentist wife. No, but it's interesting. Think about it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, you. for Spira. That was fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> Our second presentation of this uh, cluster it comes from Professor Martin Rummett from Rutgers University. Uh, stem cells is big news all the time, whether it's for scientific reasons, political, religious reasons. <laughs> topic, and uh, we fortunately have some of you with us. Uh, I know there are other people in the country who have also spoken, uh, but um, uh, with a very important group, and dealing with, I think, something that, that links into our larger topic, developing opportunities from state so we so, uh, Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I studied in an engineering school, and I haven't dealt much with engineering until the last couple of years, but so this is a, actually a very interesting uh, conference for me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in general about stem cells, and I think you know a lot about them, so I'll go through that quickly, and then focus on neural stem cells and their potential for um, improving the situation after a spinal cord injury in, in particular. Um, and maybe just to start out with, is this a pointer? Yes. Um, we're working in the Center for Collaborative uh, Neuroscience at Rutgers University, which was founded almost 10 years ago by Dr. Wise Young. Many of you um, know Dr. Young. And um, what I wanted to remark because of the discussion yesterday that in terms of the patient interactions, I'm not a physician, but I get to see patients on a regular basis. And the reason is because Dr. Young set up on a monthly basis what we call an open house. Um, once a month, patients, their families, and spinal cord injury come in, and they talk about research, they talk about um, clinical trials, and the interactions that occur are uh, very, very interesting. It also has a, a very interesting effect on the people working in the laboratory because they have such a sense of purpose when it comes to doing uh, work because they see somebody who comes in as paraplegic. They see Christopher Reeve, who has come to visit us uh, in the past. And it's, a, it's been a very interesting experience. And it's one that's hard to do in a typical laboratory setting, but in an unusual setting like we have, 
uh, and, I, and I think it's something that uh, scientists need to think uh, more about. Now to the, um, to the issue uh, more at hand. So um, what I'm going to do first is just basically tell you a little bit uh, about uh, stem cells. You know a lot already. Where are they found? They're found primarily uh, in the embryo. That's the first place that they're found. Um, and what are embryonic stem cells? I don't need to talk to this audience about that. I think you know what those are. And what are adult stem cells? And the, the important concept is that one can create a stem cell line. Now, a stem cell line, even though they call it a line, is not a fixed object. It's a moving object. And uh, they only can go so far. So I think we need to realize when we're talking about cell lines, um, they have some marking in them that after 100 or 200 generations, they're not the same. But for today's purpose, uh, we don't need to worry about that too much. Um, I, later on, if we have time, we can talk about who's investing in stem cells in the States. It's an interesting story that's probably going to change because of politics. But basically, a stem cell is one that will give rise to identical copies of itself, two other stem cells, and it must also retain the ability to differentiate with, like for our cells, into neural stem cells or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. So a stem cell must have both these characteristics to be a stem cell. If it doesn't, then it could be a cancer cell. And actually, the cancer field is learning quite a bit uh, from stem cells about what may be the potential of cancer stem cells and how one has to think about treating tumors, not to treat the tumor, but to treat potentially the cancer stem cell. So the distinguishing features of stem cells are that they replicate and they give rise to different tissues, and we heard about this uh, yesterday in terms of cardiac stem cells, et cetera. Um, their potential for therapeutics are very great um, in terms of uh, degenerative diseases, injuries, uh, cosmetics. Um, they also may be a very useful uh, vehicle for delivering uh, gene therapy, which has its own problems. Uh, it's only be really beginning to get moving by itself. And as you know, uh, if one does, develops a line of embryonic stem cells, one can expand them quite exponentially. You can get tremendous amounts of cells, but they can also then differentiate into neural cells, cardiac cells, or, or blood cells. And we'll be focusing on the neural lineage, not on neurons per se. Obviously, this process uh, uh, after fertilization in vivo, the embryo is a free-floating uh, object up to about six or seven or eight days when it becomes implanted, and it's very accessible until that point. One can isolate an embryo. One can take out the, uh, the, um, the inner cell mass and develop embryonic stem cells from there. Once it becomes implanted, it's much less accessible. So a lot of work has been done on the earliest stages uh, here, and one can actually take and isolate the inner cell mass, and one can develop the cells grown on fetal layers, and now the technology is moving towards trying to grow embryonic stem cells without fetal layers because all of the lines that President Bush has blessed in the United States um, are all contaminated now with mouse genes. So uh, there's a need to develop new embryonic stem cell lines, and people are doing that and developing them either on human fetal layers or on uh, synthetic fetal layers, and there are a number of different solutions that are coming. And then these can be formed into embryoid bodies. They can also differentiate into your favorite tissues. And the key is uh, learning what the signals are to push them in these different directions. And just uh, as an example to show you um, how this eight cell stage embryo is accessible, it's uh, coated uh, by a membrane. So one needs to enzymatically get rid of the membrane. And you can also dissociate the cells enzymatically. Now you can see the eight cells. And you can go ahead and actually go in and pick out a single cell. Now, for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, ah, too bad. Uh, you would have seen a picture of a micropipette pulling a single cell out of an eight-cell cell stage embryo. Um, for for science, that's not so important anymore. Although for uh, for ethics and for politics, it's quite important because uh, one can isolate a single cell and then keep the embryo alive, and that can justify embryonic stem cell research for the NIH to fund, but that hasn't happened yet, and we'll probably get a new president before that happens.
But companies have been investing in this, uh, and they've been pushing this technology as well because um, they're very worried about uh, their image and bioethics. So this is, it goes beyond uh, government and politics. So let me, let me turn now to the neural stem cells. And just briefly, the, the nervous system really develops from a sheet that after induction by the notochord will turn into a tube. And this tube, at the ridges of the tube, you have what are called the neural crust cells that will give rise to the whole peripheral nervous system. And the blue here will form a tube, and that will give rise to the central nervous system. Now, as the nervous system develops, there's the ventricular zone. And right around the ventricular zone, what you have here is basically this is a, a, a hollow um, fluid-filled area. You have cells that, in, as stem cells initially are dividing, they're replicating, and the tube is growing. And eventually, they will divide, uh, after they divide symmetrically, they will begin to divide oops, asymmetrically. And when they do that, then they can give rise to cells that will become neurons. And the neurons actually migrate out along these other neural stem cells. I'll talk about that more in just a couple of minutes. But in the adult, there are very few stem cells. We have stem cells in our hippocampus. Uh, we have uh, stem cells in the olfactory bulb. These are neurons that are uh, being generated throughout life. And where they are generated in are special regions called niches that you know lots about. Um, and what's, what's interesting is these, in these niches, the stem cells divide very, very little. So when a patient undergoes chemotherapy, it's not these stem cells necessarily that are killed, but it's these rapidly dividing cells that are, that are becoming neuroblasts, and therefore one can regenerate uh, stem cells in the body. So there are very few stem cells in the adult, and that may um, contribute to part of the problem of spinal cord injury, which I'd like to focus on now. So with the spinal cord injury, uh, what happens is in, in, in an adult spinal cord, there are very few stem cells. But in spinal cord injury, uh, you have an initial uh, injury after a contusive type of injury that uh, a small amount of tissue is damaged, um, and that will be followed by a number of inflammatory processes, uh, cell death, a loss of myelin, which causes uh, axon fragility and more axons. So initially, you have a very small region of damage, but you come back weeks and months later, and the area of damage can be much, much greater, can be more than 10 times as great. So we've recognized that in addition to the initial damage, you have this secondary damage which, cause, which occurs over a protracted period of time, and that gives us an opportunity to go in and try and protect. Um, because it turns out in the spinal cord, you only need about 10% of your axons to get about 90% of your function. So if we can protect just a little bit, we may be able to do quite a bit. So a number of years ago, uh, so we actually set out to try and promote regeneration, um, which you heard about from Micha Spira, and it does occur, but there are tremendous inhibitors and numerous inhibitors in the injured spinal cord, for instance. And what we're now focusing on is to um, limit this uh, damage, which I'll talk about now. So just to uh, remind you, in the development of the neural tube, you have these radial glial cells. The neurons will begin to differentiate and migrate out onto the uh, radial glial cells and will reside in their mature regions. And actually about five years ago, it was discovered that these radial glial cells not only are the guides, but they also are the neural stem cells themselves. So here's a cell that has two properties. It gives rise to the nervous system, and it serves as the guidance system for the nervous system. So schematically, if one were to look at the developing nervous system here and take a slice of it, here's a, a column from the developing uh, cortex or spinal cord, what you'll see is there are these long cells called radioglial cells, and these cells can be 100 times as long as they are wide, and they support the migration of neuroblasts to their final position. So the question that we ask is, if we apply these cells to an uh, injured nervous system, will they actually uh, surround and can they form... Uh, bridges. And it turns out that they actually can self-assemble in the spinal cord for reasons that are not totally clear to us. And uh, they actually, they respond to their environment. So in an embryonic environment, these cells will line up with the embryonic radioglial cells, as shown here. So here we're transplanting these cells in green. They have this GFP that you heard about. And you can see a single cell in an embryonic uh, nervous system that's developing. If I take the same type of cell and put it into adult brain, 
And here we wanted to ask the question, it's very hard to look at nerve growth in the mature brain. So what we did is we gave the radioglial cells, which are shown in green, and we also gave neurons, which we labeled in red. And what you see is you could give the neurons by themselves, and we're looking at this region of the cortex here, and the cells tend to migrate in the corpus callosum. You see that the cells, these labeled neurons, can migrate a little bit. And however, if we co-transplant them with the radioglial cells, you notice two things. The migration is dramatically increased, but also there are many more cells that seem to survive. So the radioglia provide guidance, but they provide also uh, support. So I can't emphasize enough uh, the properties of these cells, but one of them uh, that's very interesting is they're transient. For the most part, these cells appear during development. They're neural stem cells. As I told you, they're very prevalent during the development of the embryo, but in the adult, there are very few of them. In the spinal cord, there are very, very few of them. So we actually, what we did is we went to take them from the developing cortex, where they're plentiful, and it turns out if you take neural stem cells and grow them, uh, a very useful um, way of growing them is as a ball. And they, the, these balls have been called neurospheres, and um, there's a misconception that all the cells in this neurosphere are neural stem cells. In fact, probably uh, very few, maybe 1 or 2 percent, are actually neural stem cells. The rest are cells that have started to develop and are becoming neurons and glia. Uh, and that presents uh, a real uh, a problem and a challenge um, to try to use these cells. So what we did a couple of years ago is we took advantage of um, vMIC as a, a virus to uh, provide vMIC to cells to immortalize them as a model. And indeed, we were able to take um, from embryonic uh, brain cells that we could then immortalize so we could get lines of these cells. And this is a marker called BLBP. It just is a marker that identifies these cells and we're able to clone out individual cells that we could get in large numbers that you could see have a more or less a bipolar morphology. And the proof that these are neural stem cells, uh, first of all, they, they express these markers of neural stem cells, which I won't go into, but they can differentiate into neurons, into astrocytes, into oligodendrocytes. So it fulfills the requirement of a neural stem cell. It gives rise to both neurons and to glia. When we take these cells and inject them into the adult brain, uh, actually here in the spinal cord, you see that they migrate, and they can migrate up to a centimeter in a week. And if you look way out here, we can barely detect anything. These cells have retained their bifolar morphology. Now, normally, there are no radioglia in this adult brain. And during development, actually, if I took a cross-section here, this is what the brain looks like with a spinal cord during development. These cells would align radially. But here, they're actually moving, and they're moving in the white matter. And that's exactly where you have to worry about what's going on with the axons. So we went ahead and actually did a spinal cord injury using the model that uh, Dr. Young has. A, um, it's a weight drop model that's now being used in over 100 labs around the world. And if you injure a spinal cord in this way, you look six weeks later, what you'll see is the cord is contracted. However, if we inject these cells, and now you're looking at a whole mount image of a whole cord, you can see that the cells have migrated into the white matter, both rostrally and cordally. And you can actually see a little bit of an empty zone here in the middle, but you can see that the thickness of the cord is maintained. So we preserve something in the cord. Interestingly, this BBB score is a high limb walking score that gives an indication. And basically, what we found is there was a difference in walking score, and the difference may not seem very significant, but the difference between a 10 and a 12 is a rat that's dragging its hind limbs and a rat that's stumbling on its hind limbs. So we've retained um, some walking activity um, by this procedure. Now, histologically, what this looks like, this is a, 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 a horizontal section through the cord, actually it's a sagittal section, sorry, through the cord, showing you that the cells have moved in, rostral and coli, and these cells, we inject them in three places, at the injury site, a little bit rostral, a little bit cordal. They have formed, they have assembled, they have self-assembled in the spinal cord. And interestingly, where they self-assembled, the axons, shown here in red, have also been retained and are bundled. So they are reorganizing the structure of the injured spinal cord. This is just another view, and this is a 3D reconstruction down here, and we can see that there's a very close, intimate relationship between these cells. 
So what, I've, what I'm telling you is that normally in embryos, these cells will align uh, radially. In the injured spinal cord or in the normal spinal cord, they will go in the white matter tracts, and they seem to be able to um, respond to the local environment. They can protect cells within the spinal cord. They change the local environment. I can't go into the details. This is all published. Uh, and they can serve as a scaffold for neuronal migration. And what we're hoping in the future is uh, that these cells being neural stem cells, if we can engineer them genetically, and we think we can do this, what we'd like to do is put them in initially to prevent damage, but later on to serve as another function, that is to myelinate their surviving axons. Because if those axons don't get remyelinated, they're also going to die eventually. Uh, replacing neurons is, I think, a very... Uh, uh, long-range um, idea that we're really not focusing on right now. So what I told you is the cord, uh, after injury, goes through an extended period of secondary damage. By putting these cells in, we think we can mitigate this damage, and we actually have uh, evidence, molecular evidence, that these cells induce signaling in the spinal cord within six hours. We can see molecular targets by RT-PCR and microarray that are changing. So uh, I think we're going to be able to get a good handle uh, on this process, and now we're focusing very much on, basically, this is an immune response, and can we mitigate this immune response? And that same type of approach may be applicable to other immune-related diseases like MS. So in the future, where are we going? Um, I told you we put vMIC in the cells. Nobody's going to want to take a cell with vMIC. It's an oncogene, but it turns out that um, activated notch, notch is a receptor involved in development, uh, <laughs> Actually, notch in neural cells is a tumor suppressor. And it turns out it converts these cells from a uh, relatively bipolar to a highly bipolar morphology in vitro. In vivo, these cells um, survive for long periods of time and retain this bipolar morphology. So we think that there are other ways we can manipulate cells to get this radioglial neural stem cell activity. Looking toward the future again, we're starting to work with human embryonic stem cells, and we have developed a technology uh, in our lab, which is funded by the state, so we don't have to worry about uh, government regulations necessarily to work with uh, different types of cell lines. And we can induce neural uh, characters in these cells, and they can take on uh, neuronal phenotypes. So we hope to be able to make neural stem cells from human embryonic stem cells, and then use them uh, potentially therapeutically. Now, um, if you can't avoid this in the press, uh, this has been uh, all over the press, um, these iPS cells, these induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically, the idea is one can take a fibroblast from anybody in this room, take four genes, these four, these four, and stick them into those cells, and they will begin to behave very much like embryonic stem cells in their morphology, in the proteins they express, in the DNA methylation patterns in the cells. So they seem to be reprogrammed. Um, and they don't seem to form tumors as, as yet. So there's a lot of excitement in the field that one can take cells, engineer them, and give them back to an individual to treat whatever disease uh, one wants to. And this has been extended recently, I think this appeared last week, from a rural of Yanish in MIT, that they took a mouse that had um, sickle cell anemia, um, engineered to the, fix the genetic defect, produced cells from them by putting in these four genes, and then made a mouse that was normal. So proof of concept is here. Um, this is a very exciting uh, technology. Whether anybody, any patient will ever get treated with these cells because they may retain these genes is of concern. And actually, we're starting a project now to introduce these genes not by putting the gene in, by getting the protein to cross the membrane. And to do this transiently, so you don't have the cells permanently transformed, and then see uh, if that'll work. Uh, that's going to be a hard project. So um, basically, the, the sources of stem cells are many. We're working with embryonic stem cells. The, those illustrated in blue are the ones we're working on. We're working on fetal uh, neural stem cells. We've started with the rat. Now we're moving to mouse embryonic stem cells because they're much faster. 
uh, human embryonic stem cells, everything is slow, and we have to deal with the problem of immunorejection in animal models. We're also working with cells from umbilical cord blood. That's Dr. Young's work. Uh, we're collaborating on olfactory bulb, which is another source one can get autologous cells uh, from the nasal mucosa. And uh, human bone marrow is a very interesting source, and we're working with a company in Israel called Brainstorm, uh, where they're taking, um, um, well, uh, bone marrow stem cells, not necessarily macrophages, and they can induce them into a neuronal-like phenotype, and those cells release growth factors which seem to be beneficial in spinal cord injury. So in the last couple of minutes, just to tell you what's going on locally for us in New Jersey, um, we're on the verge of putting up a building that's being supported by the state for $270 million. We recently had a bond issue that was rejected for $450 million to support research over the next uh, decade. We think that'll go through next year. But there's also uh, private and uh, industrial money coming in and a lot of interest from uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies um, to get involved in this type of research. So the Stem Cell Institute of New Jersey is a collaboration between the state, Rutgers, and uh, UMDNJ, the local uh, the, the medical center. And we will probably look at many different approaches uh, for stem cells. And there's a strong impetus on uh, therapeutics. And the last two minutes, I want to tell you about another technology that we're using. Uh, the spinal cord is very difficult to work with because the, the, the volumes of material you can put in there are tiny. In the rat, we can put in maybe about one microliter. And here, we're actually supplying with a mini pump uh, this Evans Blue dye to show you that the dye actually can diffuse quite a bit, uh, even up to the brain here, uh, within the spinal cord. That's true for small molecules. Larger molecules, like antibodies even, won't move that far. But we're starting to work with an Israeli company on siRNAs. These are small molecules that actually have uh, quite nice diffusion properties. Here I can show you, here's a spinal cord. Uh, in green, you have this uh, la fluorescently labeled siRNA that it was injected into the cord. It's making its way out into the dorsal root. And it, uh, it can actually move quite a bit. And it loves to go into the vasculature. I don't know if you can make this out here. This is a blood vessel. And the cells lining the vessel have accumulated this siRNA. So we think we're going to be able to target. And actually, we've chosen one target, which I can't tell you what it is yet, with them. And I told you about this BBB walking score. And when we inject this uh, immediately uh, before injury, and we're going to be looking at after injury soon, uh, excuse me, we see a improvement in this BBB walking score. This is targeting a single molecule. This is just about the most uh, impressive uh, result we've seen with a single therapy so far. And what's beautiful about this is we're going to be able to use siRNAs to multiple targets, and there's going to be very little interaction, we think, uh, unlike other types of drugs. So these represent novel therapeutics. Obviously, combination therapies are going to be very important for many diseases and spinal cord injury in particular. Uh, companies are working on cell transplants, combining them with neurotrophins. Um, there, there are a bunch of different modalities. The extracellular matrix uh, is a major limiting factor, and uh, there are studies going on with conjointinase to digest the um, extracellular matrix that's part of the scar, and they seem to be very promising. And actually, we're going to be targeting, turns out the expression profile for the enzymes that make the conjoint sulfate proteoglycans is slow enough that we think we can target it with an siRNA. And that's one of the projects we're working on. Now, Dr. Young has been off on sabbatical in the Far East, and he's put together a very impressive uh, spinal cord injury network in uh, China that includes um, 17 uh, leading medical centers and he has others along the way, um, which we're hoping in the future uh, very, which should be very soon, we'll start doing clinical trials, multi-center clinical trials, looking at therapies, um, which should be able to have thousands of patients a year. There are quite a few companies that are starting to get involved in uh, spinal cord injury. As I mentioned, uh, we started to work with Brainstorm on bone marrow mosaicomal stem cells. We're also working with Quark Pharmaceuticals in Israel on uh, siRNAs, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of other, this is only a, a partial list. It's outdated already. 
So I, I want to uh, thank Dr. Young for getting me involved in spinal cord uh, injury research, and this is uh, the team um, working in our center. Thank you very much for your attention. What have you got to say to polio patients? Give me a year to think about it. I have two um, questions. So one thing, what is the time between an accident and using the therapy? And the second question, um, I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't know if I understood you at the very beginning correctly. You said that cancer may have cancer stem cells. Is this a suspicion or is this, are there already evidence? Okay. So the, the first question in terms of the timing. So um, there's only one approved treatment for spinal cord injury. That's methylprednisolone, which was developed by Dr. Young. The, the um, protocol is to give it within 24 hours, and there's uh, about maybe a 20% benefit uh, to the patients. Um, the therapies that we're talking about here um, we think are going to be accessible to patients because most patients um, in China, I think every single patient within the first couple of days gets a surgery to stabilize the spine. That would be a perfect time to inject um, some reagent. Uh, in terms of the profile of the molecules we're looking at, we expect that many of them have a, uh, because we're looking at an extended process of secondary damage that occurs in a rat over a month, in a human it occurs over several months. So we think we're going to have a good window of opportunity. Regarding uh, cancer stem cells, there's a lot of debate in the field, um, but I think a lot of the cancer researchers will admit that in many of the tumors, there are cells that show properties of cancer stem cells in the sense that you can eradicate 99.9% .9 of the tumor cells and these small percentage of cells is refractive to chemotherapy, other therapies. Um, so they behave as stem cells. They can be refractory. They can then regenerate themselves and then go on and reproduce. So uh, there's a lot of thought going into not only debulking the tumor and getting at the tumor, but how do we get at the cancer stem cells? Because if we don't treat them, uh, we're going to be in trouble. It's been shown in mouse that you can regenerate its comparable system the entire immune system with one cell. It'll go to the bone marrow, it knows how to get there, it will reconstitute the entire immune system. 